pretty much sums up life as a whole, doesn't it? <laughs> life is full of many experiences. It's my pleasure now to introduce our speaker for this morning. Um, Reverend Ken has been a mentor, a teacher, a friend, a counselor, a confidant to me and to many others. Um, he's trained all of the ministerial students that have come through here and more. Um, Reverend Ken was part of the beginning of this church when it went independent from the national. And he's kept it going for a few decades, probably about at least three and a half, maybe four. And we're so blessed that he's still with us and we can still benefit from what he so lovingly gives all of us. So I know most of you, if not all of you, feel like I do about Reverend Ken. He's just one special human being, and we are so grateful that you are here at Center of Enlightenment. So let's welcome Reverend Ken Novacheski. Thank you, Reverend Carol. That was embarrassing when you had to get up here and follow all that wonderful introduction. <laughs> and thank you for that song, by the way. Yeah. It must have a message in there for me. That's the second time this morning I've heard it already. Oh, wow. It was on my car radio on the way in. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> I better pay attention. Hey, this morning I'd like to talk to you. The name of the night sermon uh, this morning is Accept One Another. And it's based on Romans 1 through 12. Romans 14, 1 through 12. Let me tell you about two churches. Both meet regularly. Both communicate a message. Both offer communion and take up a collection at every meeting. They both have their own unique music, which inspires and confirms their faith. Oh, and there are hypocrites in both. You won't find a church of any kind anywhere that doesn't have a few hypocrites warming the pews. <laughs> the first church meets in a state-of-art worship center. It has padded theater-style seating and a huge projection screen and a killer sound system. Instead of a preacher, they project amazingly produced parables on the screen, complete with soundtracks and the latest special effects. The music is all pre-recorded, but it is strictly professional. In fact, it is some of the best music in the world. The message they preach through their projected parables is quite simple. You can sum it up in one word. Tolerance. You believe what you want to believe. I'll believe what I want to believe. I won't judge you. You don't judge me. As I said, there are hypocrites among them. Because while they preach tolerance, they don't always practice it. Sometimes they are quite exclusionary. If you don't measure up to their standards, you can still come to their church, but you won't be very welcomed. If you don't embrace their values, they won't embrace yours. Despite the failings of many of their members to practice what they preach, their church is quite successful. In fact, they have congregations all over central Alabama and in every major city in America. It's called the Church of Culture, and they meet in movie theaters everywhere. The contributions usually run about $8 a head, and it's collected at the door. Communication consists of a bag of popcorn and a Coke. That costs extra, though. You can even rent the sermons and take them home if you don't feel like going out to church, in which case you'll have to buy and provide your own communion. The other church doesn't have the most comfortable seating. Attendees sit in pews. Communion consists of a small piece of stale tasting bread and a uh, half a swallow of Welch's grape juice. It's free though. The the contributions are a free will offering. 
The accompanying music is live, but by the standards of the culture, not very inspiring. Rather than communicating the message through special effects and enhanced movies, the guy gets up, reads some words from an old book, and talks about them for 25 minutes. The message is compelling, though, even though the medium isn't. Instead of tolerance, the church preaches acceptance. What's the difference between tolerance and acceptance? To really go in deeply into it, read Romans 14, 1 through 9. In these words, Paul reveals how and why brothers and sisters who don't agree on emotionally charged issues can do better than just tolerate each other. He explains why we can accept one another. So let's put what Paul calls a disputable issue on the table. By disputable issue, he means something that isn't clearly outlined in, God, in the will of God. Something good that people can disagree on and still accept one another. If I were a raging fool or a courageous crusader, I'd give you a long list of things that I think are disputable issues and we would fight about them in church. Since I'm neither, I'll follow Paul's advice in verse 22 and keep that between God and me as private property. But there is an example that I thought this week as I read this passage. Monty Python was a comedic troupe from England. Some people think they are hilarious, but some just don't get it. Regardless of where you fall on a Monty Python scale, between their sketches, they would fade to black and show a short cartoon and a voiceover guy would come on and say, now for something completely different. It is no secret that Reverends Marie, David, Keith, Carol, and I are all different types of people with different types of preachers. Now we have been together for only a few years, but we have all worked for this congregation and for the church as a whole. But to say that we are all different is an understatement. But we have really learned with one another to, t to actually get along with one another, to accept one another. Tolerance is long gone. There is no tolerance between us. We get along well. I have come to an understanding that there are some differences between them and myself. The problem we run into too often is that we get the urge to say that one is right and one is wrong. If you agree with me, you are conservative. If you don't, you are liberal. And those titles are thrown around like a dirty word. And there might be tolerance, but I believe that we are called on to do more. And I believe we do. If Paul were here, he'd be blunt. He would say, Ken, hush now. Who are you to judge your brother? Who are you to look down on your sister? There are some very good reasons for us to accept one another. And that's in verse 3. If someone measures up to God's standards, they certainly should measure up to mine. Or are my standards higher than God's? Hmm. Refusing to accept someone God has accepted is a dangerous form of adultery. Adultery is nothing less than making something or someone higher than God. In this case, it is making your litmus test for acceptance tougher than the test God has given. You and I are not judges. Some of us are forever trying to kick God off the judge's bench and occupy it ourselves. We somehow think we do a better job than he does. Last Friday, while standing in Myers, I was talking with one of the employees there, and I invited him to one of our message nights. And they declined because they were Methodists. And I told them, I didn't care if they were a cactus. We would love to have them. They told me that 
a preacher told them once that they were going to hell and wondered what I thought. And I told them any preacher that could condemn them to hell would probably be there themselves. <laughs> we have sometimes forgotten that our job is to teach, encourage, and love people that God loves, to tell everyone the good news with our mouths and our lives and through our hearts. But all too often we would rather judge, and that too is adultery. Even with our disagreements, we are members of the same family. Six times in 11 verses, Paul reminds us we are brothers and sisters of the same family, that being God's family. Members of the same family are called upon to accept one another. Think about your own family for a minute. Are you all exactly alike? Of course not. That's why. And that's why they drive you nuts. But it's not your differences that make you dysfunctional. It's when someone in the family tries to make everyone else in the family just like them. That's what follows up the works. Did it ever occur to you that God put us into families so that we would learn how to accept people who are not like us? He didn't do it just for laughs, although sometimes it's funny how we react. The family is the first place we run into the wall of differences. Not everyone is like me, but I share something important with these people. The same last name, the same house. We're in this together, and our membership in the family is more important than the differences that threaten to divide us. As a congregation, even more is at stake. We don't share the same physical gene pool, but we spring from the same spiritual father. We all had the same big brother, and there is, coursing through our spiritual veins, the same, the same Holy Spirit of God. So since we are family, we are called on to do more than just tolerate each other, each other but to accept one another lovingly and warmly. So what's the difference between tolerance and acceptance? Just think of some of the synonyms we could use to to for tolerate or tolerance. There's endure. I think we should endure people no matter what they believe. How about stomach? All opinions must be stomached if we're going to be a civilized culture. Suffer. I don't agree with your view on that, but I'll suffer it. Put up with, bear, deal with, swallow, abide. None of these sound very nice, yet that's what our culture settles for. In the passage we heard in the beginning, the Bible calls us to a higher way of relating to brothers and sisters with whom we do not agree. It demands acceptance, not tolerance. What is acceptance? It means to welcome someone into your fellowship and into your heart. It implies the warmth and the kindness of genuine love. Tolerance on steroids so which church would you rather be a member of? One that puts up with you? Or one that embraces you with acceptance? I'd like to tell you that we should accept everyone in this room, in this congregation, everyone on Zoom, into our family. We should accept them all as they are accepted by God. God isn't waiting for you to get your life all fixed up or straightened out or tucked away before life, before he can love you. He already does. That is our example. We have to love one another, accept one another. 
and the fact that God loves you is something we need to accept as a fact. Not be tolerant, but let us be accepting and loving to all who enter these doors, all who are on Zoom, all who participate, so we can celebrate together our lives and enjoy them more fully in the presence of God and His love. Thank you so much. <laughs>